Margarita and today we are talking about how to intercept a radio. This is video number 3, so if you're interested in the topic, first of all I would recommend that you watch part 1 and part 2. And if you're interested in this topic anyway, well, join me in my pilot lounge. Good, so back we are with our video number three about how to intercept radials. If you are unfamiliar, I shall remind you that there is a video disclaimer concerning, uh, well, how should you interpret all the videos that I am recording, uh, otherwise we can keep going on with our path number three, uh, which is actually a practical use of uh, the RMI on how to navigate IFR how to intercept a radial. Uh, now, before we go any forward, first of all, my apologies for the long wait of this video. The reason, as you very well know, is that I have a very limited resources uh, through the flight school, through Aviumar, to the sponsor. Therefore, unfortunately, due to the limited success that this video are recording, and I understand the public is very limited, what happened is that we couldn't allocate as much uh, energy, as much time to the video production as I wanted. For this reason, it's very important, your subscription, so I invite you straight away, before you start looking at this video, to subscribe on this video and then here click on the bell and uh, subscribe to the, uh, uh, to the channel so that you get informed when you get new videos coming out. What we're talking about today is the usage of the RMI, having position awareness, being able to calculate the wind by looking exclusively at the RMI and the HSI. Today pilots, they are in the usage, on, in the habit of using the FMS to determine the route. We will see in the PBN video, which will come probably in a few months from now, because as I said before, uh, it's gonna take time, unfortunately. But in the PBN video, we will discuss how precise can the FMS be thinking that the magenta line is where you want to be, is where you want your aircraft to be, well, it's a mistake and this could potentially uh, cost a lot to the pilot. There are, there's been several accident and incident occurring in time because of this. So the problem is the pilots that determines that usage of the VOR and the HSI to determine its position is time and effort consuming and therefore does it only when it's legally required because the FMS does not work, well, that pilot is an IFR qualified pilot and he is legal. So don't misunderstand me, there's nothing bad, he is legal, okay? But as I said in the beginning, very often the companies will not be very happy to have pilots like that. So companies will be looking for pilots that have a continuous position awareness mainly based not only on the FMS, but also on the conventional navigation. And that's what we are talking today. Not being a child of the magenta, not being blindly thrusting the magenta, not thinking that I want my aircraft to be on the magenta. I want my aircraft to be on the correct route. And that, that is the key element. I want it on the correct route, okay? So let's get to forward today and First of all, we're gonna talk about the dock 8168. Good. Before talking about how to use the RMI, we should talk about the IFR navigation because the two things are connected together. Actually, they shouldn't really be connected together. I can tell you, well, personally, uh, when I do IFR training to my students, I start uh, the course saying, okay, we're not going to use any charts in the very first two or three sessions, okay? So we don't do use any charts, we just work on positioning exercise, we just work on 
being able to move around the space looking at the VOR, being able to control the aircraft in three-dimensional volume uh, just looking at the VOR and after I am satisfied with the fact that my student is capable of determining his position, knowing where he is, knowing where is he going, then we can start talking about IFR procedures because talking about IFR procedure meaning it means that you have to follow a specific route, a route that has been published. And now what I found very often is that students do not know what IFR procedures are. So we talk about DMR, they don't know what the DMR, we talk about um, uh, holdings, they don't know what a holding is, okay? So that is the main thing. Let's give a look to the doc 8168, which actually contained the basic principle of IFR navigation so that we can give a general look of, you know, what should we do using the uh, aircraft instrumentation. Good, I'm now taking the uh, dot 8168. You see that we have this uh, picture, the uh, uh, 1411, okay? This describes how a procedure is supposed to be constructed with the initial approach fix, the intermediate approach fix, and final approach segment, go around, initial and final go around, okay? If we go on in the description of uh, DOC 8168, uh, we can find that it is described how the initial approach segment should be uh, composed or should be calculated. The intermediate uh, approach segment, where it clearly say that if this picture 1411 uh, could not be respected, then well, in that case, a reversal procedure would be provided. So the first thing I would like to underline is that reversal procedures are alternative procedures in the case a normal procedure could not be designed. And then we got the description of reversal procedure that a pilot should be able to fly, okay? If we go on, this is talking about the, uh, of course, the intermediate approaches. And then if we go on, we got the uh, uh, indeed, the final approach segment, how it should be flown, definition about ILSs, definition about non-precision approaches. And then we, we can find also uh, about a chapter, a specific chapter about the holdings, okay? So holdings is what it really makes me interested because we're going to talk about how to enter the hold as well. But very often I realize that the problem of hold entry is not a problem of having a technique, I mean, a correct technique, is first of all, knowing how an aircraft should enter a hold. So what are the maneuvers that the aircraft has to do in order to enter that holding, okay? So that's a very important element, I would say. How can you enter a hold if you don't know what should be the track that the aircraft should follow? In simple words, if I depict a holding for you on a piece of paper, would you be able, with a pen, to draw the tracks that the aircraft should fly in order to enter the hold and to fly this holding. I realize very often that pilots are unable to do that. Now, if you can't do that, how can you pretend you can enter the hold? So there's no point in moving to a method to make an old entry if you can't do that, okay? Now, as I said before, if you gain a full position awareness and you know how to move your aircraft in the space, well, there should be no difficulty in making holding or making any other maneuver because you are able to move your aircraft in the space, in the three-dimensional space, in the way that you want. So we will see that actually the difficulty of the holdings is not the flying the track itself, is remembering, knowing by heart, what is written on DOC 8168, which I would say it is a requirement for a commercial pilot. You must know what the DOC 8168 says, okay? Well, I won't waste too much time. There is just one last thing I want to show you is that if I go back to the reversal procedures, there we go, uh, you can see that there is one reversal procedure that is very particular because unlike the word says, although it is a reversal, it doesn't revert. It's just a holding. It really looks like a holding. In fact, it is called a procedure hold, okay? Now, the purpose of the procedure hold, why all reversals has the purpose to revert the track of the aircraft, okay? The purpose of the procedure hold is actually just to allow the aircraft to lose altitude. So it means that there is an inbound track for the approach runway, which give you a minima which is too high, the aircraft wouldn't be able to fly the approach. And because 
the minimum SOI because the aircraft is in a position where, yes, it is aligned to the runway, but it's too high for the approach, then a holding, something, a procedure that looks like a holding, is flown. But it's technically not an holding. That is the thing, that is the main thing, okay? There's not an holding, that is a procedure hold, which has very few di differences, okay? Uh, among the requirements to leave the fix for the procedure is the fact that the aircraft is established on the inbound track for the moment of the approach. This is the procedure that the aircraft is established on the inbound before it leaves the fix for the procedure. But I care in clarifying that, yes, there are some uh, particularity. For example, if you go look the parallel entry, it is identical to the holding parallel entry, but it is required that the aircraft is established inbound the station before reaching the station, while on a parallel entry for a holding, there is no such requirement. So you might do your parallel entry and fly direct to the station, okay? I'm not gonna go into much detail on how a holding is flown, direct entry, offset, uh, parallel, and so on, because as a professional pilot, you should be able to go on the dock 8168 and determine and have acquired the required knowledge uh, to, to know what the entries are and how those entries are flown. So, for the moment, we just move forward from this doc 8168, although we would have to talk for hours about what's written in it, and we're going to talk about some uh, radials intercept. So, we're going to start with a very simple exercise in order to be able to, uh, how can I say, to introduce a little bit of concept that might be useful to us, okay? So let's move on the uh, usage of the RMI. That's what we're talking about. The, we could talk about the Doc 8168 uh, for hours. There will be a lot to say, uh, but I think as a professional pilot, you should be able to go on that document, study it, and understand what is written and what you should fly with your aircraft when you fly an IFR procedure. Um, talking about how to use the RMI. Let's take this example. Let's talk about how to use the wind, how to work out the wind on the RMI and the HSI, okay? So in this picture, I've set the HSI on a course 240, and you can see that the aircraft is more or less en route, is like eight degrees off route, okay? So uh, with this HSI, of course, we should fly to the left in order to correct the, uh, uh, the deviation from the route I want to follow, okay? Uh, now, if I take the uh, uh, Jepson compass, I set course 240, as you can see in this picture, and then I should look for the wind. So let's say that the wind is 180 at 20 knots, okay? I should find out where is 180, where is the circle of 20, and now if you're a smart guy, your instructor should have told you that, yes, if you use the circle of 20, it's quite a small circle, so it's quite hard to see. So you can multiply by 3 and then redivide by 3. So rather than using 20, you can use 60. Because with 60, the calculation come out easier, okay? So with this calculate with this 60, you can find out by following the circle of the 60, you can find out where uh, <clears throat> what is the component of headwind, what is the component of crosswind, so you can see that headwind is exactly half of it, is 30, okay, but we say we multiply by 3, so I should re-divide by 3, which means that the headwind is 10 knots, okay, and then I can find the crosswind, the crosswind again looks like uh, something around 55, 56, so, uh, well, I could say 18, uh, maybe a bit less, yeah, 54, so 18 works less, works very well, I can say we got 18 knots crosswind, okay? So by having 18 knots crosswind, coming back to my HSI, I could say, okay, I have to turn a little bit to the left in order to correct the, these winds. Now, how much to the left? Well, it depends from your aircraft. If you fly a Cessna 152, the wind correction angle is very simple, one, the Cessna 170, with a ground spin in the range of 80 knots, you're gonna be using like half of the crosswind. So if you got 18 knots, you're going to be 9 degrees of wind correction angle. If you're flying a faster aircraft like a 737, then the wind correction angle is smaller because the aircraft fly faster. And so you might use easily one third or one fourth. I normally start with one fourth, which 
is normally working pretty much well. Well, I could do all this calculation without looking at the Jepson computer, which makes my life much easier, okay? Let's take this HSI and let's draw on the HSI. As you can see, I've drawn on the 180, a wind vector of 20 knots. So exactly as I do for the position exercise, where I say the old circle is the DME, well, now I use it for the wind speed. I say that the old circle is the Jepson circle of the 20 knots, okay? So you can see that the circle of the instrument is 20 knots, and then, same as I did on Jepson computer, well, I divide the two components, the headwind component of 10 knots and the crosswind component of 18 knots. By having these, well, if I fly on a 737, I say that I would use one fourth of it, so it would be more or less four degrees and a half. Maybe I would just put five degrees on the left side. You see, this method is very useful because you visualize where the wind is coming from. So obviously, you have to put the nose into the wind. So the direction in which you have to put your wind correction angle is quite instinctive. It is nose into the wind, okay? Uh, this method might be quite useful even when you have to turn onto a specific route even if you are on an intercept heading okay let's take this example i have a wind of 300 degrees at 25 knots and i am intercepting the course 280 okay so as you can see from this picture there i'm on a heading i'm an intercept track of the course 280 with this wind of 325 knots okay now when i intercept the uh, the course, I would like to turn out onto a heading which automatically corrects for the wind correction angle. So I would like to guess what will be my wind correction angle at the moment I will be on route. So not what I have now, because 300 degrees 25 is, is a lot of crosswind, but not what I have now, what I will have later on. Well, again, I got my HSI set, so I do this calculation, not with reference of my ax aircraft axis, but with reference to the HSI. So you see, I depicted this 25 knots wind vector. I used the old circle of the HSI as a 25 knots uh, circle, okay? And then I might decompose the two wind components, okay? You can see the headwind is nearly everything because 20 degrees opening is nearly 100% headwind, isn't it? So we're more or less 23 knots headwind, okay? But I can see that the crosswind uh, still is a bit less, I would say one third, okay? Um, half of 25, I write down 13, so one third we would be more or less in the range of eight knots crosswind, okay? So basically this gives me the number, eight knots crosswind. Now it depends from the aircraft I'm flying. Am I on a Cessna 152? Half of the wind correction angle, it means four degrees. If I'm flying on a 737, I said would use probably one fourth. One fourth, it means I put two degrees, two degrees to the right, because it's the nose towards the wind, okay? So I just, it's easy to understand on which direction I have to turn, okay? I have to put the nose toward the wind, and the wind is going to be to the right. So it means that when I will uh, roll onto the intercept heading, instead of rolling onto heading uh, 280, I would just take heading 282, and I should have the wind correction angle already set for the navigation, okay? This could be, for example, the situation where um, uh, where I'm holding on a runway and I get the clearance for takeoff. Now you get the clearance for takeoff, you have to very quickly estimate uh, the wind components to see if you are within the performances, okay? So again, this method is a valid method to evaluate, okay? Now, in this example, I use still the wind of 300 at 25 knots. So you see that 325 knots on this kind of uh, uh, runway 1.5 would give me a components of 13 knots uh, crosswind and 22 knots tailwind, which is probably too much. But anyway, this, this is very quickly give me an idea of what are the wind components uh, on the route that I want to follow, okay? So with this, it's going to be very useful when I do my calculation for the navigation because I can quickly apply a roughly correct wind correction angle when I turn onto a, a specific direction. Good. Let's start now using this comp set to uh, a radial intercept, okay? Let's take a simple exercise um, that I'm trying to find. 
Yeah, this picture is wrong. Cannot be. We will start with this uh, simple exercise where I want to intercept a radial. Okay, uh, let's say uh, you see in this very, very first picture, I'm flying on this uh, heading of 090. Okay, uh, my instructor asked me, uh, okay, intercept radial 180 outbound. Now, first of all, as I said in the previous video, when the instructor asks you something, you must be able to interpret what it is because this radial 180 outbound will transmit on the fact that it's me selecting a specific course so the question is what course should i set you know to intercept radial 180 about so you should be able to understand as it is on the second picture that you have to set the course on 180 so the radial 180 outbound correspond to the course 180 outbound which is qd romeo 180 you should be able to do this calculation without any effort. It shouldn't be any complicated to you to do this kind of uh, reasoning in terms of terminology, because in aviation, all the three types of terminology are used. So please be able, be in the habit of using those three types of different terminologies, okay? So once I've set the course, then I can do my own calculation using my own method of intercept radial we say this more or less uh, um, easy or a bit more complicated methods i would say this radial intercept yes it's a radial intercept that not all the methods will be able to satisfy for example if i just continue on the current track as i'm doing now that this will look like like correct you know because the hsi bar is towards the nine so somebody would say okay just take 90 degrees intercept Put the number which is closer to the deviation bar to the cdi and uh, well if you put the nine as you can see by using uh, the method that i described in the previous videos um well what happens is that you fly straight until you intercept but you actually intercept the qd mic you actually intercept the course inbound rather than the course outbound so you can see that this could put some pilots in a bit more difficulty if you don't have a solid understanding of your position a solid method of intercept okay uh, i could put you even more in difficulty by telling you okay i want you to intercept this course outbound by remaining outside of the dme8 okay we're now dme15 so you must intercept remaining outside of dme8 now again this is just position awareness exercise it's not a big deal but you must be aware of your position and you must be able to produce a plan of action in order to make, to satisfy these intercepts you know in the next picture i give you an example for example i i would be able to make this intercept even by just taking one heading but of course if the instructor asks you something like that you could very easily uh, say okay i'm going to use two different headings i'm going to use one heading until one point and then i'm going to change track and use a different heading that's perfect okay but you see in this example uh, I select as a track 160, the correct track to remain outside, just barely at the limit of DME8, to remain outside and go intercept the radial 180 from. Okay, so the course 180 from. I also have to notice that the wind is 060, 20 knots. So now I have to take into account this wind vector, which is nearly 90 degrees. Yeah, a bit more is 100 degrees with the selected track. So if I depict this wind vector with the 20 degrees, I can see that it is basically all crosswind. And if it's 20 knots crosswind, okay, as I said, one quarter of the crosswind is five so i should take five degrees to the left so my final heading instead of being 160 which is track in order to fly track 160 i'm gonna be flying heading 155 but i could go even farther and telling you okay i could do the calculation of what will be the crossing when i'll be in route okay when i'll be a route well i have a 20 degrees intercept so it's not going to change that much but when i will be a route probably just going to be four degrees wind correction angle okay I'm going to have something like uh, 16, 18 knots crosswind, something like that, okay? Because I just bring the component of the crosswind onto the, onto the 9, let's say, and I discover that it's not the full circle, just a little bit.
So now I turned on to adding 155, you see the DME is decreasing, and I can still, with the use of the RMI, I can still evaluate the how correct is my navigation, okay? So you see, I draw the line from the tail of the needle, where the aircraft is, on a straight line. Actually, this line is not perfectly a straight line, because of the wind, I actually have a little bit, I'm pushed a little bit to the, to the right side of the instrument, okay? So I can see that without winds, I will be really tangent to the 8 DME circle, okay? And because there is the wind, actually I'm on the safe side, the wind is going to help me in staying away from the 8 DME, which was the requested limit, the requested DME I wanted to be out, okay? And you can see that I also can estimate that more or less I'm going to be stable on the radial more or less at 20 nautical miles, okay? As I do this navigation, I can estimate what will be the wind components when I will be en route on this radial 180. So you can see I can decompose the wind vector and I see that I have half of the wind, 10 knots is going to be the, the tailwind and the crosswind component is going to be more or less 80 knots. So before I intercept the, the course, I can already estimate what will be my heading when I will be stable on course and I expect to be more or less on heading 176 something like that because I'm using one quarter okay if you fly a Cessna 172 you would lose, use uh, half of it so it would be 9 degrees you will be on heading 171 but you see that with this method of visualizing you don't need to make any mathematical connections should it be left should it be right you know I'm just looking where is the wind coming I put the nose in that direction and that's how simple it is okay it doesn't require any any mathematical calculation it's just the Jepson computer calculation dividing the crosswind component by two or by four depending on the aircraft and the problem is sorted out okay good Let's move to one of the most hot topics uh, for uh, the RMI usage, which is the hold entries, okay? So as I said, the hold entries, I don't use any specific method. As we just said, I just know where I am in the space, where I want to go in the space, and I just decide how to maneuver in order to remain in that space, okay? To start with something, let's take this example where I want to hold on the course 160 inbound right turns, okay? Remember on the first video we discussed terminology. Terminology could be, uh, again, a problem because this uh, course 160 inbound right turns could be, again, misunderstood with the radial 340. So the Americans will tell you hold on radial 340 and the European will tell you hold course 160 inbound. So make sure you don't misunderstand terminology otherwise obviously your ex old exercise will be screwed up okay and then of course you you have to look where you are we at the moment of radial one two three something like that uh, we want to hold uh, we say the one six zero inbound right turn so the first thing to do is to check set your HSI this will be a good help okay you might not even once you got experience, you don't need to use the HSI, okay? It's going to come automatically, so uh, the HSI is an additional thing. But normally, uh, in training, yes, we do use the HSI because this gives you a good help, okay? Now, why I say you don't need to use it? Because if you're flying an aircraft in conventional, most likely you will have to turn direct to the station and you will use the HSI in the VOR function to navigate direct to the station. So your HSI Let's say it's busy uh, for the navigation to the station because you use the Vorlock function, which is coupled to the HSI course. So you can't set the course of the holding. So yes, it's very good practice to be able to determine a hold entry without the usage of the HSI. 
but very often you got multi-crew aircraft where you have two HSI so you can put one HSI for the navigation and the other HSI of the other pilot which is used for the uh, navigation for the uh, sorry for the calculation of the hold entry okay so very often when you do a hold entry which is not made with the with the FMS uh, the HSI is factually available so it's not a problem using the HSI now I've set the HSI on the correct course 160 so once I will be on the inbound leg of the of this holding the HSI will be centered and that's the thing I have to first of all determine where I want my aircraft to go, where it should be in the future. Well, in the future, it will be in the holding, okay? So I must understand where the holding is. Now it is depicted on the instrument. I depicted the route of the aircraft, which is flying on the radial 340, course 160 inbound the station, okay? So this has to be clear because I have seen very often pilots being unable to draw the holding. I see pilots that they draw a straight line that goes through the station and continues straight after the station. Now, if this is the case, this is your problem, okay? If you can't draw the holding, you will never be able to understand your position, where you are into the holding, you know, how to fly the holding. So make sure you know how to draw the holding and where, how to enter the holding, where you are in the holding, okay? So, uh, as we say, this is, we go inbound, station is in the middle of the instrument, so we go inbound the station, and when we reach, when we reach the station, what do we do? But I said 160 right turn, so once we reach the station, we turn to the right, 180 degrees track, and we fly the outbound leg. So that's it, that's the holding, okay? What I need is the inbound in the direction of 10. If I want, I can close the picture of the holding with the old biscuit, okay? And we can find the typical angles, if you remember, the 30 degrees, okay, and the 90 degrees, the 90 degrees that I will use to start the time. So when I will cross radial 250, I will have to start the one minute once I am in the hold. And at the end of one minute, I should, in theory, find myself on radial 310. So you see that I found all these informations without making any calculation. I just draw with my fantasy the holding onto the instrument, okay? Now, to avoid making any mistake, what I can do is just count the lines, okay? Because it's 30 degrees, the, the 30 degrees of, let's say, the offset entry or anyway, the 30 degrees that I should have at the end of one minute. Because it's 30 degrees, I just count for 340 to 330, 320, 310, okay? So I count three lines and these three lines is the 30 degrees. So Actually, I didn't do really any any, calcula any com complex calculation. I didn't do any math, okay? As you can see, the 90 degrees is quite easily, uh, quite easy to find because I can use the dot of the HSI. I keep going straight with the dots and I take the number that is there, okay? But again, it is all a visual exercise, doesn't require any calculation at all, okay? Once I did this, now I have to determine what are the entries, all right? So, well, I sh could take, or I should take the uh, DOC 8168, as I did in this picture, and put it on top of the HSI, as is done in this picture. And then I found the uh, three sectors of the DOC 8168, and I can then determine in which, in which sector I am, you see? Indeed, I am on the tail of the needle, I'm already one to three, so I'm fully in the teardrop entry. So, well, yes, this is the purely theoretical uh, exercise that I should do, but still is not an easy method. So I would try to find a little bit, uh, how can I say, a bit more friendly way to determine which entry I should fly, okay? Uh, so to do this, what I do is that I always look at the 30 degrees of the uh, offset entries, okay? So these 30 degrees, uh, why am I interested in that? Because if I do an offset entry, it's the only entry where I can track a radial. So I can actually track radial 310. And because I track a radial 310, well, I have a perfect awareness of my position. So uh, I, even, uh, I can even estimate, if I have a DME, I can even estimate what is the tailwind component if this uh, navigation system doesn't give me the wind itself, okay? So, uh, what I think is that the offset is the best entry because it's the easier to fly. You just don't fly the heading, you just fly the, the radial outbound and you have an absolute uh, awareness of your position. 
So starting by this, I just look the opposite way because the opposite way, as you can see, is actually where we are, okay? But the opposite way is the sector number two, is the offset entry sector, okay? So I start by saying, am I in the offset entry sector? That is the idea, okay? How do I determine this 70 degrees? Again, the, the thing that you have to know by heart is that it's 70 degrees. That, that is part of doc 8168. So if you don't know that, you can't calculate the entry, okay? Uh, well, of course, one is the opposite. So the opposite is 160. And that's, again, I can see it on the instrument. I don't need any math. And the other one is 70 degrees. So from the 90 degrees of the HSI dots, I have to count two lines to make it 80 and then 70 degrees, okay? So I take the 90 degrees, which is very easy to identify, count two lines, and it come out that radial 0 to radial 160 is the 70 degrees arc when I fly the offset entry, which is actually my sector, so I already know that I will be in an offset entry, okay? So you see, to determine the entry, the offset entry, didn't take me any effort. Now, what if the tail of the needle is falling somewhere else, so I'm not in the offset entry area? Well, I can find the parallel entry area very simply because this time is the 110 degrees. So I go the opposite way. And the important thing is that we always look at this point, at the point of the HSI. We first identify the teardrop, which is opposite to the radial of the 30 degrees, okay? And once we identify the teardrop, then we move the other side because the parallel still is opposite side of the holding. When you are on the same side of the holding, you always have a direct entry. So being on the opposite side of the teardrop entry, the parallel is, we say, 110 degrees, so is 20 degrees more. Now, because I say that my favorite is the offset entry, is the teardrop entry, I would say that the the best is always on the smaller sector, okay? So I remember 70 degrees is the smaller sector, 100 degrees is the larger sector for the parallel, okay? So again, I get the, the dots for the uh, for the beams. This time I have to add two lines. So I can see that from radial 160 to radial 270, this is the radials from which the aircrafts are entering using the parallel entry, okay? And finally, all the remaining from radial 270 to radial 0, zero will be the radials where the aircrafts are entering uh, on the on the direct entry procedure okay now for what concern ourselves as i said we are in the uh, teardrop entry or the offset entry so we have to fly direct to the station and we have to find which heading to fly to the station and then we will leave on this radio 310 now to fly to the station i have to take into account this wind of 0 to 0 30 knots so you see that I first have to turn to the right, but as I turn to the right, the wind is pushing me from the back, okay? With the wind pushing me from the back, well, uh, what it will happen is that I will lose a few degrees in the turn. Not only I will lose a few degrees in turn, but as I try to fly straight towards the station, I will have to put a heading which is more into the wind. So probably the first heading I'm going to set is going to be a heading in the range, well, here I marked 315. I would probably try with that, because if I have 30 knots, well, um, I should consider one quarter of 30, which is more or less 8 degrees, okay? So, a few degrees, I lose it during the turn. 8 degrees I needed just to correct for the wind. So, yes, as it is depicted here, like, rather than using just 5 degrees for the turn, adding this additional 8 degrees, I would try to turn straight away into heading of 314, something like that. And I expect that heading 314 to be the correct heading to track the radial inbound, so it should be 8 degrees wind correction angle once I am inbound the station, okay? Obviously, as I overfly the station, then what's going to be the second heading? And when we talk about holdings, I only always um underline okay think about the sequence of headings what was going to be the first heading what's going to be the second heading what's going to be the third heading because very often i see pilots that work very hard on the holdings they can determine what is the hold entry and then when we ask okay but let's fly this entry and then we realize that we get lost we don't know what the sequence of headings is going to be okay 
So that's what I'm saying, okay, and just describing. To go to the station, I need this heading 314. Once I am over the station, what heading is going to be? Well, as I say, it's going to be track 310. Track 310 with this very strong crosswind, 0 to 0, 30 knots, which is, again, is going to be all crosswind. So again, I'm going to have a 8 degrees wind correction angle. So if the first heading was 314, well, to make tra uh, track 310 plus 8, I would probably be on the second heading at, on heading 318. To make a track of 310 and tracking the radial outbound you can and i recommend you to track the radial outbound so that you are precisely where you want to be at the end of the one minute you can even correct for a wind so if you would have a strong headwind you could say okay i'll add some time normally we do half of the headwind component okay well in this case the headwind component we could decompose okay and realize that you have something like five knots maybe five knots headwind so it will be like two seconds more is quite irrelevant good remember to tell to yourself where which direction will i be turning okay because very often in the hold entries pilots turn in the wrong direction so as i just said the second heading is going to be 318 and at the end of the one minute i will turn to the right and it's quite obvious as you can see i'll turn to the right to get back inbound the holding okay as i get back inbound the holding now with this wind of 0 to 0 30 knots i'm gonna have a good 20 knots crosswind as you see i decompose this this part with this 20 knots crosswind well if i use one quarter it's five degrees so it means that the third heading is gonna be 155 so you see i didn't even turn inbound the station as you could see by simply looking at the hsi rmi a well-trained pilot can say without any difficulty, because it's just a matter of seconds once you are in the habit. That is the thing. You must be in the habit. If you're not in the habit, if you never do it in your life, well, it's going to be extremely time-consuming. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to have it wrong, okay? But if you are in the habit of doing it, if you are in the habit of using your RMI NHSI for or to calculate your your navigation route okay a professional pilot that is not what we call a child of magenta well a professional pilot is able to tell you in a matter of seconds what will be the entry to the hold what will be in the next three headings and tracks that he wants to follow so i could calculate the wind correction angle and the tracks i want to fly yet the the entrance to hold without any difficulty is not uh, how can I say, it's not a complicated exercise, it's not a time consuming, it's just uh, as distinctive, as simple to draw a line with a pen on a piece of paper, okay? So that's a very simple thing. Let's move forward. Uh, let's take another example. In this example, I will uh, ask you to hold on the 030 uh, inbound with right turns again, okay? Of course, you have to set the HSI. So we have to set the HSI on 030 and we have to visualize where the holding is, okay? So again, the holding, I have to depict the aircraft that flies on the 030 course inbound the station, reach the station, turn to the right. And in the next slide, that's where the holding is. You remember what they say? They take as a reference this 30 degrees, just count three lines, okay? So this counting of three lines goes from 210, 200, 190, 180. That's a 30 degrees, okay? I take this 30 degrees, take the opposite 360. So the radial 360 is the offset, teardrop entry. There's a starting point where I start. And then I have to find this 70 degrees arc where the teardrop entry is valid. And to do that, I always use the dots of the HSI, count two lines. So you can see that I can find the radial 340, uh, sorry, radial 320 uh, to radial uh, 030 is the offset entry. From the radial 030 to the radial 140, we are in the parallel, and all the remainings are direct. Okay, so I will find myself in the direct entry sector. And well, so the question, as I said before, when I want to calculate hold entries, the question is, what are the first three headings you're going to put? So indeed, I'm going to fly direct to the station. So I'm going to be turning to the right, okay? 
Now here, the wind is not given to me, so I will consider 112 as the heading and the track to the station. As I overfly the station, I will fly outbound, so the outbound heading uh, is exactly the, um, the 210, is exactly where the tail of the HSI is. And then I can predict that when I turn inbound, I will probably overshoot. So I should put the heading to re-enter, to return onto track, okay? For those reasons, for example, I could tell you, okay, let's make uh, what we call the, the French entry, okay? What is the French entry? Well, the French entry is a, an entry which is done where you are within a 40 degrees from a bin the station opposite side of the holding, okay? And again, this entry is not part of the Akio. So if you decide to do this entry, perfect, you can do it. But be advised, this is not an, a standard IKO entry. That is what they call French entry because it is used um, by the French. It is on the French. It is acceptable, uh, let's say, according the French the French authority to do this kind of entry. Uh, but again, that is a specific procedure. Uh, I would say regional procedure, which is not applicable to all over the earth. But yes, you can do this kind of entry where you go direct to the station. And then, overfly on the station, you fly straight by 20 seconds. Why 20 seconds? Because 20 seconds is the length in time of the radius of turn of an aircraft that turns standard. I'll get back to this in a moment, okay? So we just continue straight by 20 seconds, and after 20 seconds, we turn right by 90 degrees. And by fine, turning right 90 degrees, I actually should find myself exactly on the outbound leg with a remaining time of 40 degrees by or 40 seconds by the end of the turn in order to turn back and join the holding. So basically by doing this entry, I might expect to uh, turn inbound and be perfectly established in the absence of wind, to be perfectly established on the outbound leg of the holding, okay? If I don't do this kind of uh, French entry, well, if I don't do this 20 seconds straight, obviously I will turn earlier. And because I turn earlier, at the end of the one minute, or those 40 seconds anyway, wings level, well, at the end of the one minute lag, I will be too close to the center line of the holding. So when I turn inbound, I overshoot. So either I do this kind of entry, which is, as I say, it's not IKEA. So if you do it, you should be able to justify why you do this kind of entry. Either I do this, either I do the standard IKEA, which says at the station I just turn outbound. And if at the station I just turn outbound, when I turn inbound, so the third heading should take account of the fact that I will overshoot. So with a French heading, with a French entry, I could say that first of all I fly straight to the station. Okay, so heading one one two. The second heading is exactly ninety degrees, heading one two zero, and the third heading is two one zero, and then I turn inbound. Okay, if I do the standard IKO, I would overfly the station. And turn right straight away on 210. So 210 is my second heading. And my third heading should be something in the range of 060, 070, because I expect to overshoot the inbound leg. So you see that although the direct entry is a simple entry, it still requires a little bit of reasoning about what track you want to fly. But the main thing is that if you use the RMI and the HSI to determine your position, especially with the RMI, you can maneuver so as to do whatever procedure you want. So the fact that we are discussing the hold entries is just because on the Akio, the holds has been depicted and determined that way, okay? If tomorrow I come and say in whatever country we do square holdings, okay? What you will have to do is just to depict a square holding on your HSI and determine what are the headings to make a square holding. So let's, for example, invent this square holding with four corners, okay? Well, what are the, the headings? Well, I should fly straight to the station, first of all, heading 112. As I reach the station, what do I do? Well, I continue straight on 120 for, I don't know, one minute at this point. We do, in this way, we do a kind of five minutes holding, okay? so. I fly 1 to 0. Once I fly 1 to 0, then I turn right by 90 degrees, so I turn heading 210. After one minute, again, I turn right by 90 degrees, I fly heading 300. 
and then I turn right again by 90 degrees and I should fly myself exactly inbound on the 030. So you see that I just invented a square holding. It doesn't exist, there's no IKO procedure, but if I want to do it, I can do it. And if we want to do triangular holding, we can do it triangular, we can do it round, we can do it the way you like, basically. The thing is, you just have to depict what is the route that you want to follow, and then you find out what are the tracks to find the route that you desire, okay? Well, at this stage, we we'll get into uh, some practical exercises. When I move to a practical exercise, I will use the, the Genova charts, okay? Uh, this is the procedure that I will uh, plan to fly. Before talking about procedures, there is one thing I didn't consider, which is the radius of turn of the aircraft, okay? So, we, you see that we have to discuss different points, the so-called leading points, um, when we talk about intercepting uh, radials. Of course, if you did the IFR training, you should be aware of what is a leading DME, what is a leading radial. But let's review this together. So, the leading DME could be a leading DME of the station. As I depicted now, you see this red aircraft over CES-3, Sierra Eco Sierra VOR. Uh, this aircraft has to start the turn in order to leave on radial 133, okay? But we have to do a 90 degrees turn over the station without overshooting the station. So the question is, uh, which DME should I turn? Now, normally, all the procedure does not take into account, or I mean, already take into account the slant distance. So the fact that when you get the DME, you don't get a ground horizontal distance, but actually you get a distance which is composed of ground horizontal and vertical distance. Well, this is normally taken into account for any procedure so when you have a dme distance at which to start a procedure when you have a dme arc well that's all taken into account but this cannot be taken into account once you are vertically over the station because obviously when they draw the procedure they don't know at which altitude you will be so this leading dme over the station is strictly dependent on your altitude okay other point that we might need to calculate is the leading DME once we are not over the station, so once we are away from the station, like in this case, I want to intercept this 19 DME arc from Sierra Cosierra. And the question is, well, when should I turn? I should start the turn a little bit earlier, but that's quite obvious that it depends from the radius of turn of the aircraft. So I should be aware of what is the radius of turn of my aircraft and start an earlier turn in order to be established exactly at the 19 DME arc. And then the last case is the leading radial. So, for example, in this case, I'm flying direct to point Tiglo, and the question is, okay, but at which radial should I start turning to avoid overshooting and finding myself over terrain? So I want to make a perfect turn, uh, not to undershoot, not to overshoot that radial, okay? So to do this, I will uh, quickly move on to uh, my personal website, uh, where unfortunately this, this, this is not accessible to everyone. Uh, and the reason is quite obvious is that the, this information has to be managed and has to be presented to the student with the, via the distractor, okay? So the reason why it's not accessible to everyone is that the instructor should make good use of this information because if it is misused, then pilot should, I would say, cause, it could cause more damage than benefit to the pilot, okay? As you can see there, obviously the radius of turn of the aircraft depends from the, from the speed of the aircraft, and in this slide we are calculating what is the radius of turn, okay? So, the radius of turn is 20 seconds, how can it be in seconds? Well, 
the reasoning of this is made on the fact that the 360 degrees in a standard turn are made with 2 degrees per second, okay? It means that 360 degrees it takes 2 minutes. So an aircraft that turns on a standard rate of turn has a strict relation between its radius of turn and the time it takes to make the 360 degrees. So every aircraft that turns standard has a radius of turn of 20 seconds. At this point, I have to ask my question, yes, but how much distance does my aircraft fly in 30 seconds, okay? And what you see in the screen is the calculation, which is quite easy, the calculation of how those 20 seconds are obtained, okay? Now you see that depending on the speed, if I do 60 knots, I do one nautical miles per minute, and 20 seconds is one third of a minute. So, Obviously, if I fly 60 nautical miles, I get more or less 0 0.3 uh, radius of turn. 120 nautical miles, 120 uh, knots of ground speeds, I get more or less 0.7, which could be the radius of turn that you have on a Cessna 170 when you study uh, basic IFR. And when you get 180, you get more or less 1 nautical miles of radius of turn. And, well, 250 knots ground speed, I'm writing down 2 nautical miles of radial stand. But why I write down so much? Well, because when you use <coughs> a speed which is higher than 160 knots, more or less, 100, uh, 180 knots, your uh, bank angle for the standard turn is 25 degrees. Standard turn doesn't exist anymore in terms of time. Only exists in terms of bank. So on a larger aircraft, your turn, 180 degrees turn, is going to take more than one minute and it's going to be flown with 25 degrees bank, meaning that the radius of turn is going to be larger than what it is on a standard turn. So with this, explain to us that, well, depending on the aircraft where you are, you should consider what is the radius of turn. So if you fly on a 737, your radius of turn is more or less 2 nautical miles if you're training on Cessna 172, we're talking more or less of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 nautical miles, okay? So, here we go. If we are flying at the MER, well, how early should I turn? Well, obviously, in this picture that I can see there, I'm coming from outside. So, if the DMER is 10 DMER, well, 12 nautical miles, because 2 nautical miles is the rate of turn of the 737. So, 2 nautical miles before I start the turn. If I'm flying a Cessna 172, probably 0.7 nautical miles or 10.7, I will start the turn, okay? If I'm coming from inside, as it was depicted before in the Genova uh, chart, but coming from inside, I should subtract. So I will, I will start the turn that was 19 DME. Well, I start the turn at 17 DME on a 737 and something around 18.3 on a Cessna 172. Well, if it's over the station, now I have to consider, the, as I said before, the altitude, okay? So I have to consider the slant distance. So as you can see, as the aircraft get closer and closer to the station, the difference, or I would say the impact of the altitude is more important. Yeah, the number is pretty easy to remember. 6,000 feet equal 1 nautical miles. It means that if I overfly the station at 6,000 feet, I will have, as minimum reading, 1 nautical miles. So all I have to do is to add, actually, uh, well, the calculation, uh, we, I should calculate the triangle between the horizontal distance of the radius of, this, of radius of turn and the vertical distance. But as we are in flight, I would say it's fairly calculated, fairly complicated to calculate the triangle, okay? So rather than starting calculating square roots and um, stuff like that, what I just do is that I add my radius of turn to the slant distance. So, for example, if I'm flying 12,000 feet and I have a radius of turn of 2 nautical miles, I just do 2 plus 2 is the slant distance plus the 2 nautical miles of radius. This may for a 4 DME, I start the turn, okay? And um, I would say that's the, that's the easier rule to calculate the, uh, the slant distance. And finally, the calculation of the leading radial, okay? I should use this formula that allow me to calculate the height of the triangle depending on the angle and the base, okay? So, it turns out that if I have the base, so in this triangle, AC, the distance between A and C is 60, it turns out that with an angle of 1 degree, I have the height, so the distance between B and C, 
is equal more or less to 1. You see the 60 multiplied tangent to 1 makes 1.04. So it's one nautical mile. So we can consider that if I have one degree difference at 60 nautical miles, well, the length of that one degree is one nautical mile. From there, I can make my calculation. So you see that I have this table underneath where I write down, well, if I'm flying a jet aircraft with a radius of two nautical miles, well, at 60 nautical miles, I need two degrees leading radial. And 30 nautical miles, I need four degrees leading radial. 50 nautical miles, eight degrees. So every time I divide by two the distance and multiply by two the number of radials. You see that when I am seven, 10 nautical miles, sorry, 10 nautical miles, I'm more or less 12 degrees, which means that the HSI won't even move and I should already start the turn, okay? So that's a good number to keep in mind on the 737. If you intercept a radial at 10, 90 degrees with 10 degrees distance, well, if I intercept at 90 degrees, I should start the turn 12 degrees before. So I should start the turn before the HSI starts moving, okay? Well, with this, uh, I just have here a, a final recap of all this calculation, okay? So just to remind you that your radius of turn is uh, uh, 20 seconds. This 20 seconds translates into 2 nautical miles on a 737, 0.7 nautical miles uh, on a Cessna 172. How to calculate the leading distance away from the station is quite easy, just your radius of turn. Above the station, just take your radius of turn, but add your slant distance, which is 6,000 feet equal to 1 nautical mile. And the leading radial, just to remind, again, it's an easy number because this 6,000 feet, 1 nautical mile, now is 60 nautical mile equal 1 degree, 1 nautical mile. So this comes back quite easy, okay? So just remember that 1 degree is 1 nautical mile at 60 miles. If I'm on a 737, then I need 2 nautical miles, I need 2 degrees at 60 nautical miles. If I am a Cessna 172, I probably need less than 1 degree a 60 nautical mile, okay? Same thing, 12 degrees when I'm 10 nautical miles, so I just remember this number. If I intercept a radial 10 miles away from the station at 90 degrees impact, I should start uh, 12 degrees before on a 737. If I'm flying a Cessna 172, well, it's going to be less than half of it, so probably 4 or 5 degrees will be good enough, okay? Um, that's more or less the calculation of the leading radials, leading DME, which is going to be needed for IFR navigation. Again, there's not, you know, not a rule of thumb, there's, there's required knowledge, I would say, for the IFR navigation, okay? So this said, we can now get, can get back to our uh, Genova exercise, okay? So we have here this, uh, this position, I am on radial 240, okay? Uh, I'm fly flying inbound cess 3 vr in this case, uh, Karen say it is very important to tune and identify the station because Genova is 2VOR. As a navigation VR, which is Golf Oscar Alpha, which is placed on top of a mountain, for better transmission. And there is a local terminal VR, which is a 3 VR, Sierra Cosiera, which is, let's say, in the valley, very close to the sea, uh, for the local procedures. So make sure that the correct VR is tuned in and identified. In this case, it is. We are uh, 10 DME from, uh, from Sestri VR, okay? And flying heading 090, and I ask you, okay, fly direct to Ixito point, okay? So we have to make a fix to fix. Well, not a problem. You have to determine where Ixito is. Now, Ixito, now Ixito, it is on the radial 182 at DME 17, okay? So I'm asking you, okay, fly direct to Ixito point. Well, we are 10 DME. You can see that if I try to depict the point, I should actually continue depicting outside the instrument. Which sometimes is feasible, it's not the end of the world, but there is a trick to simplify the, the exercise, I would say, is that actually I baptize the, the circle of the instrument, the diameter of the instrument, as 20 nautical miles. So if you use this, well, again, it's another technique uh, similar to what I normally use, 
but if you use this at this point your aircraft is not on the tail of the needle but your aircraft now is halfway on the needle because we determined that the whole instrument is 20 miles so your aircraft is on the tail of the needle but is moving back and forward on this tail depending what your actual dme is because dme 10 is exactly half of the me 20 well my aircraft is on the tail of the needle but exactly halfway through from the center of the instrument to the exact tail okay now with this i can see where the radial 182 dme 17 is located and i can find where xido is and i can mentally depict a line that connects me to xido okay I can also depict the holding. Now, to depict the holding, once again, to help me, uh, the best solution is to set the course on 182. So the 182 will help me in drawing the holding. Now, it's a course inbound exito. So we have to be careful when we depict, because as I said, the holding is normally depicted on the tail of the HSI with the aircraft growing inbound the station. But this holding is not inbound the station. This holding is inbound a fix, and this fix is on the course 182 at the ME17. So, if I am this time on the point of the HSI, flying inbound the Xito point, I am established on the inbound leg of the holding. So you can see that there I have depicted uh, the Xito holding, which is in between the ME17 and the ME13 with left turns. Okay. So I could see where the holding on a fix is, all right? Now, I would like to know if I go to Exito, what kind of entry to the hold I should fly, okay? Now, to calculate the entry to the hold on a fix, well, it's definitely not an easy exercise. It really requires you to be familiar with the usage of the RMI and the HSI. So it really requires you to be good with the hold entry using the RMI and the HSI. But what I did to calculate the hold entry, okay? Well, I simply translate, transport the Exito holding onto the station. So I pretend that the holding is not over Exito. The holding is on Sierra Cosierra VOR, okay? Course 182 inbound with left turns. Now, I calculate the hold entry of that holding with course 182 inbound left turns, okay? And as I said before, what I use is the 30 degrees, okay, so the 30 degrees, it will be um, 0, 3, 2, okay, so I use the 0, 3, 2 and go on the opposite side to find out what is the teardrop or the offset entry sector, okay. So in that holding, actually, I will be on the teardrop offset entry. Now, I just mentally take back this holding with this hold entry and retranslate, retransport it again on the Exito, okay? So, now that I transport it on the Exito, I realize the teardrop offset entry is actually far away from where I am, and I'm now falling on the straight in, on the direct entry sector, okay? So with this, I could easily determine that I am on the direct entry sector. It is true that there will be a range of distance and radials where it might be difficult to determine if I am on the direct entry sector or in the uh, teardrop of parallel sector, okay? Like at this moment, for example, I draw the line of the teardrop and the parallel, but if I tell you, okay, I am on radial 1 to 0 at 20 nautical miles, okay? It's very hard because I'm really at the edge of the parallel and the direct entry sector, okay? But still, this method gives me normally a good appreciation, a good idea of what should be the hold entry I should fly to the fix. So in this position and definitely in the direct entry sector, okay? Uh, as I did this calculation for the direct entry sector, I can calculate, okay, what's going to be my track uh, to reach Exito? And as you can see, I take uh, adding uh, 150, um, which is the track inbound Exito, and actually it happens that the wind is actually coming from 150. So I don't have to make any wind correction angle because I'm going to be straight with my nose into the wind. There's not going to be any wind correction angle. And um, I can predict that once I will be on the holding, I will have 10 knots crosswind 
10 knots crosswind translate on a 737 with something around uh, 2 3 degrees wind correction angle which of course is going to be towards the wind so once i am established on the leg inbound instead of 182 it's going to be 179 in the leg outbound well it depends if you want to make three times the wind or just once the wind it is up to you but still your heading is going to be still more in the eastern side to correct for the wind okay so uh, again i can predict i'm going to put heading 150 the first heading i put the second heading as i reach exito as i reach radial 182 17 dme i'm going to be turning left on the outbound leg and on the left rather than putting heading 002 I will set an heading which is more into the wind well in this case i just said okay just make once the correction of the wind which means that my overshoot when i actually turn inbound and if i correct just once the wind well the wind correction angle is going to be three more degrees or so something around heading 005 on the outbound leg to correct for the wind and the third heading what's the third heading is going to be well as i said i expect to overshoot when i turn inbound so you see that the third heading is not going to be 182 corrected by the wind but it's going to be something more it's going to be a heading to get back onto 182 because i will overshoot on the other side so i expect something around heading uh, 155 150 something like that should be good enough to re-enter to return on track for the holding okay so once again you see that with this method i can calculate all the headings I can calculate all the tracks I need. I can predict what will be the wind, what will be the wind correction angle. Good. Now let's take this different example where still in Genova, I am flying inbound SES3 VR. Again, very important tune identified. It is tune and identified, and I find myself 40 DME. Okay. I get asked to intercept uh, the uh, QD mic 313. Okay. What is QD mic 313? Is the radial. 133 to overfly the pound g cut okay now you see that in this case the uh in this case just making a simple interceptor radial is not really going to be enough because when you set uh intercept well you should be able to intercept before 20 dme because g cut is a 20 dme and if you intercept for example 10 dme inbound now it's too late now you're in the wrong incorrect position if you want to start the ifr procedure for the approach in genova you must be established at least 20 dme possibly i would say even something before so if i just ask you okay turn right and intercept yes you have to turn right and intercept but you should be able to determine that you will intercept at a distance which is consistent to overfly g cut and then start your procedure now, once again, do you really need to use the fix-to-fix -fix method uh, to determine this? Well, no. In this case, you remember uh, in the previous video I told you twice the error of the distance. Well, with 40 DME, if you use twice the error, so if you put the heading more or less uh, in the range of 350 degrees, which is twice the error, you're going to be there establish half the DME. And GCOT is exactly half the DME. Now, you could say, okay, I want to be safer. So instead of putting twice the error, just put a bit more angle than twice the error. Uh, let's say 350 plus something. And you expect to be established earlier than 20 DME, okay? So yes, that's no strict need. But again, you could use a meter that give you a bit more awareness of the situation. So let's try to gain a bit more situation awareness. First of all, where is the runway? Well, the runway is runway... Uh, 28 in Genova. So I depict the runway exactly where the VR is because the runway and the VR are exactly at the same position. And so the runway is at the center of the instruments where the uh, VR is. And I can depict the approach that it's some nine, coming from the 19 DME arc. So more or less 20 miles off of the instrument is the approach which is coming with a little bit of offset, the LS in Genova has a little bit of offset, and I can depict G cut. With G cut, we say this DME 20. So I can set G cut on this 313 inbound, okay, uh, which is more or less half of the distance that I have now from the station. The old circle of the instrument now is 40 nautical miles, okay. 
Now that I could depict this, I could tell you even more. I can depict also the missed approach. The missed approach we say is to Exito and it was radial 182 at 17 DME. And here we go. I depict this little overshoot of the runway because when I do the missed approach, I have to initially climb straight. And then I will turn left and reintercept the 182 and fly to Exito and get this holding between 17 and 13 DME. So what you see in blue is the missed approach procedure. So basically, on my RMI, I can easily, without any effort, simply by knowing these reference points, okay, 20 DME, uh, the inbound course of the VOR, so runway to 8, the 182 for the missed approach, I can reproduce exactly the position of all the procedure without making any effort. Once this is done, I can easily calculate the track to get direct to any point of this procedure, okay? Uh, actually, what I depict in this picture is also in yellow, this radial 098, which is on the, on the chart, uh, that determines where the terrain is, okay? So this 098 for the terrain area, so I can see where the terrain is, I can tell you clearly that we're now over the sea, so there's no problem with obstacle in our position, okay? Getting back to our intercept to GCOT, again, I want to go to GCOT and make sure that I am established before 20 nautical miles. So I can do this calculation. You see what we said before, before I told you adding 350, take a bit more just to make it sure. And you see that with this calculation, it come out something like adding 360, okay? Now, here we got also the wind. So we can calculate and correct also for the wind. And I can see straight away, if my position is 280, if I go ahead in 360 with the wind coming from 280, I'm going to have all the way 20 knots crosswind. So actually the wind is going to be helping me in intercepting the radial. So if I want, I can even get a little bit wind correction angle to the left. One quarter, uh, one quarter, yeah, it's, it's four degrees, five degrees. So I could take something like adding 355, or I could just say, okay, just let the wind drift me and I will intercept earlier so that uh, I'm over GCOT earlier. But if I want to go straight to GCOT, well, then I should account for the wind. And yes, I should take a heading which is more or less on the, on the range of 350, 355 in order to correct for this 20 knots crosswind, okay? Now, let's pretend that I got instructed to hold. So again, calculating the hold entry, it is very, very easy. I could do the exercise that I just said before, so I should take the holding with the inbound 280 and, uh, sorry, the inbound 313 and the right turns, okay, and bring it over the station and do the entry calculation. But simply by depicting the holding of a GCOT, I would say it is pretty evident that I am on the straight in uh, direct entry sector. So here I can say, okay, straight away what's going to be, well, now I continue something around 350 inbounds, okay. And as I reach GCOT, the second heading is going to be more or less, well, it should be the opposite of the 313. So we are talking of the uh, 133, but again, I have to correct for the wind, which is coming from the left. So probably I would put a little bit of wind a bit more on the left to correct, sorry, on the right, on my right, to correct for the wind. And so the second heading, uh, we say second track should be 131, and as you can see the line is a bit more to the right, so probably I'll put something like 135, 136 to intercept, uh, I mean to keep the track on the holding. And once I turn inbound again, my third heading, which should be 313, but yes, I still expect a little bit of overshoot because as I reached the holding, I didn't do 180 degrees, I did a little bit less, so already the turn was a bit shorter. Uh, but the wind has been pushing me out of the holding, so I could try to keep the heading 313 or something like that. I could try to put a little bit less than 313 because that is going to be the heading to maintain the track inbound uh, GCOT point, inbound CES 3 VOR, okay? So normally, because I have 10 knots crossing, I expect to have something like one quarter, three degrees of correction into the wind. So on the left, so instead of 313, it's going to be 310. But again, all these calculations I did without making any math. I just look at where is the wind coming from and I put the nose of the aircraft toward the wind. Okay. Good.
this is the picture how it looks like when I finish the turn with all my calculation and of course I can check out the progress of my procedure okay uh, if I, I am flying to GCOT again I can take the adding around uh, 130 uh, even a bit more 135 when I turn for the holding if I don't turn for the holding I will have to take as we say that in 310 3 degrees wind correction angle 310 to go inbound to intercept the DME arc. Now the DME arc is very close to GCOT, so we have to, de to determine also what will be the leading DME, or which DME should I turn in order to leave for the correct DME arc, because DME arc from uh, SES3 is 19 DME, and GCOT actually, to be precise, is 21 DME from SES3. So 21 of your mice, I will turn immediately on the DME arc, actually, I have to take into account if I go GCOT direct and then turn into the DME arc. I'm actually not turning by 90 degrees, I'm turning less than 90 degrees, okay? So, because I turn less than 90 degrees, my turn is going to take less than 2 nautical miles. So, with the track I'm having now, possibly I will need to continue straight a little bit, just a few seconds, maybe half of a mile, and then turn by the remaining 60 degrees just to get the station a beam, okay? So this is more or less the picture when I passed GCOT, because we say GCOT is 21 DME, and I am 20 DME from SES3. I am established on the inbound radial, and I have to turn to the right to intercept the DME arc, okay? Now, getting the DME arc, as you can see, is I have to take the 90 degrees, I have to put the the VOR on my wing at 90 degrees. Uh, I, can, I shaded the area of the terrain and my leading radial for the turn is going to be radial 106, okay? So, at this point the turn, and at the end of the turn, in this example, I get 19.3 DME, okay? I have 90 degrees angle with the station, so I'm actually established on the DME arc, and I have to make corrections to remain on the DME arc. This is the DME arc as depicted. As you can see, I'm slightly outside of the DME arc. On radial 112, I will be turning on the left, okay, to intercept uh, the final track, to intercept the ILS. And this is the miss approach still depicted with the 182. So that's my full picture. Actually, again, I can depict the rain as well. That radial 098 that keep me, that tell me, okay, I'm still over the sea. But now I'm flying a DME arc towards the terrain, okay? So, how do I correct for the DME arc? Well, theoretically, in the absence of winds, when the station is exactly on my wing, on my wing at 90 degrees, so when I see the green tail of the needle exactly on the white line of the RMI that give me the 90 degrees, well, the DME will not move because I'm exactly 90 degrees with the station, and so I'm perfectly on the DME arc. So what I should do is every 10 degrees to make this needle swing from 5 degrees above to 5 degrees below. So I should always turn 10 degrees, 10 degrees, 10 degrees to make this needle move 5 above, 5 below, so that the DME always remain constant. If I want now to consider the wind, which I have to consider 280, 20 knots, I can see that the wind is coming from my left wind and is pushing me outside of the DME arc. Now let's exaggerate on this picture, I made a green cross on the VOR, let's pretend that the VOR <coughs> is really out of the position of a DME arc, okay? Let's pretend that we are on the radial 160, so we're not 90 degrees with the station. If my aircraft would be in that position, the 160, obviously by flying straight, I would get inside the 19 DME arc. So the DME would definitely decrease. So I can say that when I have this minus 5 degrees, so the needle is below the beam, when I have this minus 5 degrees, the DME is slightly decreasing. And if I exaggerate as I did there, the DME will definitely decrease, okay? The other way around, if I say, okay, just make a green cross on the actual VOR and depict another tail of a VOR, in that case, you see that I'm actually flying outside the DME arc, so in that case, the DME will be definitely increasing, okay? 
So, to correct for the wind is exactly the same calculation. So, I have to estimate what is the crosswind component. And you can see that the crosswind component I have was more or less 18 knots. So, one quarter of the 18 knots is something in the range of 4 degrees. And now, it means that I have to take a heading, I have to make wind corrections, so that I am by 4 degrees, I'm flying inside the... Uh, the DME arc. So instead of making this plus 5 minus 5, the new plus 5 minus 5 are those blue ones which are just 4 degrees below the beam, meaning that the needle will always stay below the beam and I will always be on a heading that flies inside the arc. So the game is making plus 5 minus 5 but not from the beam, just from below the beam so that I always fly a little bit inside the arc and the wind is pushing me outside the arc okay this is what will be the the first turn after the heading 035 what will be heading 025 as you see now with 19.3 dme i got some nearly 15 degrees or a bit less than that i got 13 degrees below the beam now out of these 13 degrees there are four degrees which are the wind correction angle so actually this means is like having just 8 degrees below the brim without wind. So I'm still getting inside uh, the, the DME arc, so I'm smoothly correcting the DME. DME arc requires smooth correction, so very uh, smooth adjustments of few degrees. Every 10 degrees always make a turn, at least 5 degrees, but always make a turn. And keep in mind these 5 degrees above and below for the uh, interception of the... Uh, of the correct DME of the DME arc. <clears throat> now, what I have here depicted is this radial 112, which is also on the chart, which is the leading radial to intercept. Now, when I do this calculation of the leading radial, I have to consider I can never turn before the radial radial, so I cannot decide to turn before the radial 112, but I might decide to turn after. The scope of calculating the leading radial is that I want to make sure that when I finish the turn, I get established on the inbound leg. So the inbound leg is 286 inbound uh, sestri VR, which in terms of radial, uh, we are talking uh, of uh, radial 106. So the question is, is 6 degrees at 12 nautical miles consistent for a 737? And the answer is yes, it is, because you remember that at 10 nautical miles, I say 12 degrees, and at 20 nautical miles is alphabet, so exactly 6 degrees. And what we have there exactly is 6 degrees between the leading radial and the radial inbound. It means that if I turn 6 degrees before, I will be exactly established on the 286 inbound. Now, if I'm flying on Cessna 172 instead, I should turn half of it, so more or less 3 degrees. So I can continue flying on the DME arc for another 3 degrees. And once I reach radial 109, I'm going to start to do the left turn and I will find myself established on the 286, okay? So this is for the uh, calculation of the leading radial in terms of verifying that this reading radial is consistent with the approach procedure, okay? So that's about this for the uh, usage of the VR on this uh, on this Geneva uh, Sestri example. Okay, so you can see again, you don't need an FMS if you know how to do the exercise. It doesn't take uh, that much effort, I would say, uh, to make to make the calculation and determine uh, what is your position, where are the tracks, where are the the, the positions where you want to fly. Uh, on your procedure, okay? Okay, we will give now uh, a word to the sponsor and then we will get back with the last exercise talking about uh, something that probably puts a lot of pilots in difficulty uh, which is the example of being vector for an approach.
Welcome to Aviomar Flight Academy, a selected training partner of Ryanair for the provision of highly qualified and skilled pilots to the airline. Our industry-leading APS MCC course has been developed to provide future Ryanair pilots with the skills and competencies as required by the airline to commence the type rating on the Boeing 737-800 aircraft. This course is entirely held in our Rome Training Center, where two state-of-the-art Boeing 737 simulators are located. You will acquire confidence to work in multi-field environment practicing tasks and theory and exercises. Unlike a standard MCC course, you will become competent in managing sequences of actions and more complicated systems are presented on a Ryanair aircraft. Ultimately, only in the Ryanair mentorate in the SMCC, the focus will be on the skills and competence required to meet the company standards and successfully complete the subsequent tech training and training. Our training is conducted by instructors with direct Ryanair operational experience. The standard of the simulator used in our Ryanair mentored APS MCC course is specified to support the training provided that represents the real airline standard aircraft. The course is structured in a way to address areas where pilots can be weak during an airline assessment and to easily adapt to a modern airline working environment. The extra emphasis on the core competencies, manual handling, airline standard simulators and instructors will provide students with outstanding preparation for their upcoming assessment. Students will be exposed to Ryanair's safety culture and operational philosophy from day one of the program, in addition to having an exclusive access to a fast-track recruitment process. Program graduates will enjoy a distinctive advantage at the actual interview and assessment stage. Why choose a standard MCC course when you can have so much more? It will be our pleasure to welcome you at Aviomar Flight Academy in Rome. Paolo's Pilot Lounge Like and subscribe now Good So in this example we are taking into uh, account this case of uh, Linate Airport approaches Okay, so we are approaching Milan Linate From the north we have set the ILS now, a very convenient thing is once you have an ILS is to have an NDB because if you have a locator or a marker as it is in Linate, you can tune in the NDB frequency, the frequency of the locator and this gives you a great position awareness. The alternative thing is to set the Linate VR and once you establish in final on the ILS, you switch the VR, Linate VR off the pilot monitoring from the VR to the ILS. But again, this remove to the pilot monitoring the opportunity to cross-check the LS, to cross-check the localizer alive, the glide slope. So it is much more preferable to have a, an NDB, to have a locator or the marker, you tune in the frequency of the locator, and this gives you a great position of awareness. Let's give a look on how, okay? So I have set in the final approach course of Linate, and I have tuned in the NDB. So you can see that I have an NDB uh, position. Now I am being vectored by the ATC. When you vector from the ATC, these pilots quite in difficulty. Why? Well, because they, they can't, or you, you can, but it is fairly complicated uh, to reproduce what will be the air traffic control vectoring on a magenta line. So basically, this force you to stay outside the magenta line. Being outside the magenta line, basically your FMS cannot calculate what is the correct profile for the descent. So now you are outside of the magenta line and you are unaware of your FMS is unaware of the correct descent profile, but you should be aware of the correct descent profile. How can you do that? Well, you see that the ILS is still not tuned the CDI uh, because we are opposite to the runway, but we are some more, some more or less 10 miles away from the DME of the ILS. Okay. So I know that the distance between me and the runway threshold is 10 DME and the distance between 
the threshold and the NDB, the locator order marker, is 4. So basically, I can depict the runway as a line on the HSI and I depict the locator order marker as on the center of the instrument, as usual. The station in the middle, the aircraft on the tail of the instrument, okay? So, I know that more or less distance between me and the station we're more or less something like 14, 13 nautical miles, something like that, okay? Uh, once I've depicted this, the station and the runway, I might try to guess what is the track that uh, the flight controller want to give me. Most likely, he is vectoring me as a downwind base final. So you see, the what I depicted there is a downwind base final where the base turn occur more or less 10 nautical miles final. I can tell you, it depends also from the minimum vector altitude because if I know that the minimum vector altitude is 2,000 feet at that destination, it means that this flight controller could guide me as close as 6, 8 nautical miles final. Well, if the minimum vector altitude is 3,000 feet, then, well, 3,000 feet, if I have to be established in final at 3,000 feet, it means I'm more or less 10 nautical miles final, okay? And that's it. Once I've done this, now I know what should be my profile, because uh, with a 10 nautical miles final, I can make a guess, okay, from this position, uh, the base, the length of the base is more or less 5 nautical miles, okay? And so it means that you see, I'm 10 miles away from being, being the, the threshold, another 20 nautical miles until the turning base, some 5 nautical miles, 25 miles, and I'm on final, and then the final of 10 miles, so I got 35 nautical miles to run, if that is the plan of the ATC controller. 35 nautical miles to run, it means altitude by 3, I should be more or less 10,000, 11,000 feet, okay? So, you see that Again, I don't need to be there programming a lot of stuff on the FMS and then if the flight controller gave me a different heading, now I have to reprogram a lot of stuff on the FMS, okay? All of this is not needed, just, you know, having awareness of his own position, of what is the guidance of the uh, air traffic controller, and then I have a complete situation awareness of what could be the track miles and the altitude I should be according to those track miles. Once again, I can even uh, increase my situation awareness by starting depicting on the instrument the misapproach. So the misapproach you see is radial 105 down to 11 DME. So what I have depicted there is the radial 105 more or less by making parallel radial 105 from Linate VR which is at the end of the runway. And from the end of the runway I depict this 105 and I depict what could be more or less a 10 DME and so I got the hold depicted there, so that, for example, if for some reason I decide that I have a technical problem, I want to go straight into the hold, well, I can take a heading, like, for example, I could say, okay, I turn left heading 090, something like that, taking into account uh, the turn radius, maybe heading uh, 095, something like that, okay, with heading 095, I can go direct into the hold and on the radial 105 at 11 DME, okay, so, this system is, again, a very nice situation awareness uh, tool. Good. With this example, we uh, completed what is the uh, discussion about the usage of the RMI and the HSI. Uh, what is behind the question, okay, how to intercept a radial uh, using the VR? Uh, as a conclusion, in those videos, we saw what are the uh, most uh, common mistakes made by pilots. Uh, Karen saying again, terminology is one of the major issues. Tune identified, believe it or not, is one of the major issues. And then having a correct technique to intercept a radial. Do you really need to have uh, such a detailed technique, or may you blindly trust the magenta line? As I said, according to the legal requirement, you might trust the magenta line there's nothing wrong in being what we call a child of magenta so thinking that your aircraft has to be on the magenta line until the system warn you when we will talk about the pbn we will see that yes there is there is some uh, let's say th there might be some problems concerning this but of course uh, many companies many pilots prefer and i would say these tractors uh, prefer to have pilots 
to teach their pilots how to have a full position awareness by simply looking at the RMI at, and the HSI. As I said before, it's just a question of exercise. If it is something that you do every day, you're going to be able to do it every day without any difficulty. And if it is something that you never did in your life, the, the day you're going to try to do it, you're most likely going to fail. You're not going to be able to do it. So make sure that you decide what is your favorite method of usage of the instruments and make sure that you are familiar with the usage of the instrument so that the day that you actually need to use it, you perfectly know how to use your navigation system. Okay, it might take years until the day you find yourself without FMS, you find yourself without GPS or something similar. But I mean, that day might eventually uh, come. So it stays to you to determine how you will behave the day you will find yourself without a magenta line. Uh, as it is, well, for the moment, this is uh, everything. So I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention today and uh, hope to come back to you very soon with some uh, new videos. Once again, I remind you to subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so that you get informed. Thank you very much for your attention today and I uh, hope to hear, you, to hear from you very soon. <laughs>